everyone and welcome to another episode this time really another edition of the other side of midnight as this program now is going out around the world literally in 160 plus countries in Europe tonight in 49 minutes two one zero seconds the Rosetta spacecraft will descend gently at about walking speed to the surface of comet Churitomenko Gerasimasso 67p And we're going to kind of cover this live. I've got my Sterling Imaging Panel assembled uh, with some new members and some old members and some blue members and some barred members. Well, that's some from another ritual. Okay. And we're going to talk about rituals because tonight, you know, S is doing something pretty weird, pretty interesting. So we're going to tell you in the next two hours everything they're not going to tell you, but that they're showing you. They're just not making it official yet. But before we get into that, which is in another few minutes, I want you to scroll down, theothersideofmidnight.com. Remember, that's our homepage, theothersideofmidnight.com. I want to crow a bit. If you look at item number two under my items tonight in Radio with Pictures, NASA this week announced they have found plumes of water jutting up through the icy crusts of Europa. And they suggested, A, this confirms the ancient ocean hypothesis under the ices of Europa that's been out there now for well on 20-some years. And two, if you look at image uh, item number three, link number three, that's a link to the Enterprise Mission, our Enterprise Mission website. I published the model that NASA has now confirmed about the oceans under the ices of Europa and the possibility of life, and I don't mean little, little tiny guys, I'm talking about Big guys like European whales or something maybe even more interesting. And I talked about it like 30 years ago in 1980. I remember it was AP called me at the crack of dawn in 1980 in December to talk about this article I'd put in Star and Sky magazine. Well, the link to the actual paper is there in link number three. And science is nothing if it's not prediction. And the reason this is important is because the backdrop to tonight's conversation and we'll scroll all the way down under my items, all the way down to image number eight. That's a book cover from the book I published this last spring, courtesy of North Atlantic Books. That's the um, uh, random imprint there, Penguin. It was an anthology, and I was asked to contribute like 15, 18 percent, something like that. And I decided to use the pages to lay out before we got to Pluto before they got the really amazing images that we've got now of 67P, before they gave us all the stuff they're giving us from Curiosity on Mars, that I would kind of do a data dump of the state of the art of the hypothesis that we are not the first. And I published it this year, as the prerequisites require, in the mainstream, in a mainstream publication, a book by a major publisher, with evidence and close-ups and a story arc laying out the idea that we live in a previously inhabited solar system and that NASA and ESA and the other agencies over the last several decades have been giving us drip, 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 very carefully controlled and censored versions of the reality that's out there tonight, that Rosetta is literally looking down on and it falls at several inches per second in a eight, nine mile plunge to the surface of 67P in a little over three hours. When we come back, our story. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland, and we shall return. Ah, and we are back on the other side of midnight to the moody blues. I know you're out there somewhere. And in ads in the chat window, hopefully, 
Yeah, there's somebody hopefully out there because we're looking at an amazing place. All right, let me get to our panelists here because I'm going to do a very abbreviated intro. Cynthia has been known in early Mars circles as Mama Mars, and we discussed that on her last appearance. She's in the San Francisco Bay Area, a well-known artist, artistic director for the Mars Project, which segued into the Enterprise mission. And she, of course, is coming up to speed like all the rest of us on all the other stuff that's been left by these guys all over the solar system that wasn't there when we were just looking at Mars. Keith Laney is a space imaging processing and anomaly specialist from Charlotte, North Carolina. He's a husband, father, grandfather, artist, copper master, amateur space scientist, and <clears throat> avid promoter and supporter of space exploration. And his stuff, his imaging stuff, is stunning. Andrew Curry <clears throat> is, uh, well, Andrew is... He began his artistic career as a community public artist, working with neighborhood groups to create murals in schools and community centers. As a graphic designer and illustrator, he served as small to large Canadian companies, and for the past decade, he's worked as a storyboard artist and concept illustrator in film and television and in commercial TV advertising. Andrew has a Bachelor's of Arts degree from the University of British Columbia, a diploma in graphic design and illustration, and a Master's in Art Therapy, which came in extraordinarily handy when we were doing analyses of Alan Bean's artwork of ancient structures on the moon that comes out in the art, but not in the verbiage. So Andrew is also with us. Moving on, Will Farrer. Will Farrer is kind of going to be our checkoff for the night. He's going to monitor communications. Will grew up in Maryland, where he started his career in technology at a very young age of 16 and is currently the information tech director of a national healthcare company which never wants us to know who they are because they don't want to be associated with the show. But regardless of that, he's one hell of a guy and he's going to be monitoring ESA communications. So as soon as the uh, spacecraft control center there in Germany uh, tells us that they are in the process of the final countdown to the crash landing, he will let us know. And last but not least, actually, there's several more here. I'm, I'm, I have a very long list this morning. Bob Harrison has been with us from the beginning. He's a keen investor. I mean, that's how he retired to do all this interesting stuff. Achieving his dream of financial independence, he decided to retire from the rat race back in 2010. And as a child of the space age, he was fascinated by exploration in space and speculations about ET life. And these have now matriculated in several websites, including Sidonia Quest, and he's been doing exquisite work on a concept called the Arcology Hypothesis on Mars. Thomas Mikey Jensen was born in Denmark in <clears throat> 1977. Oh, he's a new kid on the block. Has his first alien sighting when he was five years old. I guess maybe some night we should talk about that. And his first UFO close encounter when he was eight. Well, that'll get you going. He is with us tonight bringing his UFO and imaging expertise and he has a popular book out uh, on, the, on, I'm sorry, a, f a Facebook group called the Mars Moon Space Photo Zoom Club, which has been active since 2012. And now, finally, last but not least, Chris Maroney, born and raised in Rhode Island, worked at Texas Instruments before becoming a tool setter for the past 15 years. His true passion has always been anything in space. And as everyone said on the last panel, they basically got into this because they always kind of suspected that the stuff upstairs may be more interesting than we were being told. So Chris joins us, and that includes everybody. And uh, I guess I should ask the obvious question, where do we want to go first? And don't be shy. Hello, hello. As everybody gets shy. Okay. Everybody has everybody. Oh my God, you've all, you're <laughs> obviously all got stage fright. Well, I, I, I'd like to jump in. This is Kinthea, and... Uh, I, the reason I'm jumping in first is because I have one image there that is not specifically related to Rosetta, but it implies Rosetta, and that is, um, it's the last image in my images, and it's it's uh, some oh, quick okay. little Okay, so we have to go to from, the we have to go to, con to the other side of midnight.com, click on radio with pictures, and we scan down to which one. The last one. Under your section, Kinthea's image. Yeah. Uh, four, right. Sidonia Pleiades. Oh, this is interesting. Yeah. So you you remember how Robert Baval came up with this insight about how the, the Plateau of Giza was laid out in the shape of the Orion, Orion constellation? Mm -hmm. Well, I found this thing on YouTube where this guy has actually taken the transparency 
of the Cydonia site, and he mapped it out, and then he's laid it over the, the Pleiades, and voila, it's matching up. Oh, so, I know this guy. He's from South Africa. Yeah, his yeah, we, name we, is we, not we, on the YouTube. We've been so in touch. I thought, we've been in touch. I'm going to have him on the show because he and, and George and okay. I did a show together some years ago. Right. He has some interesting ideas. He also has some pretty far-out ideas, but you're right. We should definitely include him in the conversation. I'm so glad you found this. Right. Well, I am, too. So the reason I found it was because I, my own take is that I really feel that the Pleiades have had a big hand in in the uh, orchestration of our solar system. And so I was doing, you know, searching for Pleiades and Mars, mm. and that's how it came up. And so my my sense is that actually this crystal ship is... A, uh, from the Pleiades is what I'm thinking. And I've also heard channelings. This is the other overlap is that I've heard, you know how in the field we have the consciousness that in the field we are all connected. And so uh, archetypal memories and ancient memories reside there and we tap into them with a degree that we're able, like a radio taps into uh, a radio wave. Some radios are more sophisticated and they get more information. And Yeah, there's, there's, there's are, even a kind of common joke about it. You know, you pick up something in the ether. Right. Okay. So so uh, my, my knowing is that in the ethers reside all our ancient memories. And um, anyway, I think that... The Pleiades are big players here, and the question is, you know, are we from Mars, or, or <laughs> did the Pleiades go to Mars and come here? Was was uh, was it, Mars one of bizarre? the first Garden of Edens wouldn't, laid out by the Pleiades? Wouldn't it be bizarre if men are from Mars and women are from the Pleiades? <clears throat> that would explain a lot. <laughs> oh, that's where I was going, is that this channel was saying that the astronauts were women from the Pleiades. Interesting. And well, I thought well, that very, very different. Okay. So then let in us, this let thing us, that Andrew move, brings let's, up. Let's move this conversation to yeah. 67P because the kind of right. fulcrum of tonight, which is the backstop of everything on Mars and beyond, is that there was this apparently incredible ancient presence. And the presence is revealed in analyzing the close-up images now that the European Space Agency has given us through this extraordinary mission, which they're bringing to a very ceremonial close tonight. Does anybody want to address the ceremony? Andrew? Oh, hi, Richard. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> it's that whole mute thing. we got to get a fast trigger finger. Uh, well, first, Richard, can I um, – I know – I could make this really brief. We last week failed to do something. It was really nice that actually Kathea came on. We, the imaging panel, came on as a bunch of guys walking through a door and letting the door kind of slam in Kathea's face. We need to welcome her and thank her very much for her contributions. Um, <laughs> I can't believe that, Andrew. Thank you. <laughs> Anyways, Rich, I had had to get that out. So. That's very nice. That's very nice. <laughs> okay. okay. So now, can someone please follow a direction tonight? Every time I introduce something, someone goes like a heifer. My grandmother used to uh, say, "Running a race with a heifer is pointless." So, Andrew, ritual ceremony. What is an Essa really doing on live global television right now? Well. Look, I refuse to call this thing a comet. I only will call it 67P because it is not a comet. And we have covered this thing over and over again, seen it from close up and from far out. We've seen – and we're going to be going over these images, and they're extraordinary. Richard, this, this spaceship, this ancient derelict spaceship is dotted with ancient spacecraft that have come to this place as, mm. as we've talked about frequently in our sort of celestial stations of the cross for you know for no better term or for a better term and they land here and it's really interesting because when we do cover the, the the two short films hopefully we have some time to do that there are so many threads at the end of that that point to this being literally a sacrifice on the surface of 67p being rosetta hmm. and following following in a tradition 
of many spacecraft from many civilizations in our past visiting what we think is the archive and a celestial city. Well, it seems like ESSA is following then a very ancient tradition because I've seen some of these things. In fact, uh, Keith found some an image this afternoon. Let's go back to Radio with Pictures. Let's back out of Kinthea's section. Let's scroll back to my section, which is at the top of the Radio with Pictures page. I went too far. Ah, darn, 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 darn. Computers, they do what you tell them and only what you tell them. So um, if, we, if we go back and we scroll back up, um, if you look at, uh, let's see, where are my image here? Image, Your item number 12. Image number, well, 11. 11 and 12. So go, go to, ele- go, uh, I'm sorry, 11 and 10. That's what I want. 11 and 10. They were, they're out of sequence, okay? Um, uh, this is where they're landing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. L- l- let me get to that next. Let me go to 12 because you're right. That's the, that's the recent craft. And when we say recent, and by the way, these are clickable. If you click on them, they get bigger. Uh, Keith, since you found this, you want to describe what you think we're we're seeing here? Uh, well, you know, the common consensus is the rocks, but the but I'm seeing a triangular craft sitting. Uh, it's like to the it's like to the far right, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's laying in a. It looks like it's crashed there. It's triangular, and it's you know it's got some details about it, um, and also uh, right to right to its right to its uh, left. There's a, another one sitting there. There's like old stuff that's sitting there. It looks like it's falling apart. So it's like we like we have ages of different types of craft, if if that what they are mm-hmm. sitting here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and uh, it's just a stunning image, and it's, it's surprising that this would come in, out right now because you know you'd you'd kind of asked for you know if, if we could <laughs> find pictures of anything that looked like this, and we started looking, and wow, there shows one up. You know, yeah. so so if, yeah, if it's if, kind of amazing. If we go back to radio pictures and click on eleven. Uh, of, of my images, this is the official uh, Rosetta map to where they're landing tonight. If you click on it, it gets much bigger. But they're landing in an area called Mott, which is Egyptian for equilibrium, truth. It was an ancient Egyptian concept, balance, harmony, Mott. So they're landing in this place they've called Mott. And in this place, there are several of these very large circular pits in the ground that are hundreds of feet across and hundreds of feet deep. And if you look on the wide-angle imagery that Rosetta took from far away, it's from these areas that some of the biggest gushing jets into space, carrying gases and, you know, ice crystals and all that, were jetting from the interior of this object. Now, the standard model says that these jets are basically due to the sun warming ices on the surface of the comet as it rotates like a you know a chicken on a barbecue spit, and you basically have thermal heating and you have this flash vapor. Except when you look at the close-up, so now we go to image number 10. This is one of the close-ups that the OSIRIS camera uh, on the spacecraft took uh, a few months ago, and we've done a little tweaking just to increase and enhance the uh, contrast. This is what one of those huge 300-foot-wide tunnels, vertical tunnels, look like. The walls are studded with thousands of little, like three feet, one meter size thingies, all arranged in a stunning geometric pattern. And they decided to lower the spacecraft, to have it fall straight down over this region and take close-ups of what that geometry is in the last few seconds before the impact and trans that information back to Earth Live. And we'll probably see images with resolutions on the order of hundredths of an inch because the cameras are going to be so close within, you know, a thousand feet of this structure at that time in about an hour. Hey, Richard. Yes, Keith. Uh, you know else? We are uh, we're trying to land this thing in uh, Dar el Medina. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the actual name of the pit that they're trying to name in. Uh, you know what Dar el Medina is, right? Uh, well, it's a very uh, it's a very famous a, well, sacred it, site it, in it, ancient it means, Egypt. It means servants in the place of truth. Servants uh, in the place of yeah. truth. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was a it was a place where the where the guys that built the Valley of the Kings uh, lived. The workers oh. it was their village, and they were like a really secret society. So S is basically claiming kinship with these ancient workers in search of truth. Well, yeah, well, they're servants of the truth, but what they did was they was they dug the tombs in the Valley of the Kings. So they were they were responsible for the preservation of the history of the pharaohs and uh, you know, the, you know, they the, were the archivists. They were the priests. Right, archivists. they were the archivists. Right. Yeah. So of course the archivists have sent a mission to an archive because sixty seven P is an ancient ship. It's an archive. Did anybody disagree with me on that? Oh no, as is portrayed in their newest video <laughs> epilogue. Okay. Do we have a link to that video? Is it under Andrew's items, or I don't see it. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, it is. It's under Andrew's items, which is just above Will's items. So maybe we want to, because we, we really can't play it live on the air, because it's what, 30 minutes, something like that? No, it's actually just just a few minutes. Okay, but but again, people wouldn't be able to see it all out of sync and all that, so we have to describe. What you do is you want to go to the link. It says, Ambition, Epilogue, pays tribute to Rosetta's final comet days. This is an official film produced by ESA, by the European Space Agency, and it is so incredibly symbolic and iconic and metaphorical. I mean, it's it's talking at three levels above the the average public taxpayer in the European Union. So who's the audience and what's the message? So who wants to tackle the message part? Well, Andrew's number six and seven, you know, he's done still shots of the of of it with okay. comments. I think so, Andrew's well, why, why do we why do we start with, with Andrew on this, who seems to be a bit shy tonight? <laughs> yeah, that would be strange. Yeah, well, okay, so if we go to radio with pictures and I hope most people are able to do that because this is a kind of an important feature tonight. And if you go to my my images and scroll all the way down to something called AC Ambition Epilogue 6, and what I've done is I've made a, a, a photo board with small descriptions of essentially the film. And I can go quickly through it. And what I want everybody to do, Richard, is to jump in and we can interpret a scene as it comes along. So does everybody understand what I'm saying here? So we'll go Good. to the series of images, graphics you've created, yeah. starting with number six. Yeah, exactly. So we open on a, a lush forest. So this is from the, the epilogue film. There were two films, Ambition, which showed these post-human type characters, uh, a master and an apprentice female, hmm. where they seem to have um, achieved hyperdimensional um, – powers where she is literally creating this giant rock in the air out of the landscape and it's a fascinating short film and we have to sort of stop there for a second Richard and explain that you know Essa would explain this as a commission piece to a film and special effects company hiring actors and crew and a director to take it through take it through to sell this to the public to the European public because obviously it's a lot of money to do this but again we think it's operating on a lot of different levels this is the second film that came later where the apprentice, the female, is now a master. So we open on a lush forest. We see a woman walking in the distance. It's the former apprentice who is now a master, and she says, so, another day. The next shot is uh, – well, the first shot shows a fallen dead tree, but the next shot, we see the sky with a giant, giant, massive tree that stretches high into the sky. And the voiceover goes – again, the master now, the female, says, it's strange. And then we see a close-up of her face as she looks up at the tree. But no matter which star you find yourself under, mornings are always cold. So right away, we're, we're on this lush planet. Um, you know, we, we don't know where it is, but we're on this, this incredible planet. It's Earth-like, but it's not Earth. And she's walking in, in the morning dew, and she immediately says it's very cold. Now, Keith, you brought up a really couple of interesting points about this. you want to cut in? By all means, well, go ahead. Well, she's seen is the dead tree, and then you're looking over it to see her and then she's going down this long hallway of, in the forest that you can see all right then uh she shows then then they show this live tree and uh it's not really included in your image there but the live tree looks surprisingly like the dead one 
Ah. Okay, now this is the and this is really symbolic, okay, because what she says is so another day as soon as she looks up the new tree. <laughs> okay, uh, as she's leaving the dead tree. Uh, okay, uh, you know, this is to me this is really symbolic. Okay, and then uh, then the next thing she says is no matter which star you find yourself under uh, and what the what in the world do they mean by that? Okay, but <laughs> mornings are always cold and mornings what type of mornings? Mornings like morning or morning in other ways, mm. but uh, you know this is all of, uh, that's all up for conjecture because makers of a film that do this planned it very well. Well, it's oh, also yeah. got uh, the uh, ultimate yeah. what, what we would call plausible deniability because they can always say, yeah. "Oh, it's just an artistic commission." They could do anything they wanted, but we know there's a meta meta message. In fact, there's several well, levels of message. At, at this time, though, in the film, though, when, after she looks at the tree and says mornings are always cold, she looks back down the trail toward the dead tree, mm. and then it shows. Then it shows Rosetta creeping up on the comet. Okay. And yeah. Well, you could then say she's referring to the ship that brought the visitors from another star to the, the solar the visitors system. Or, from the or, dead tree to produce a live tree. I mean, the metaphors just come tumbling out. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And as, and up? also, as M has suggested, mornings are beginnings. You yes, know? yes, this of is course. the beginning of a new age. That, well, it goes three to ways to come out publicly and say, "Yeah." It's that's it, they, 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 If you find they use the three way, they they use the three way concept. I tell you what, hold it there. Gosh, time is really flitting. We're at the bottom of the hour, <laughs> we're on the other side of midnight. A very interesting panel. We're discussing what does Essa really mean by releasing a film which basically talks about reincarnation, resurrection, and new birth from the deadness of Rosetta's vision. You're on the other side of midnight, and we shall return. And we are back on the other side of midnight on this Friday morning. We're in the night of the black moon. And before you think horror stories and Blair Witch and all that, it's just a kind of an obscure technical term, meaning that we had two new moons within one month, within the September. First day, there was a new moon, meaning the moon was kind of between the Earth and the sun, not an eclipse, but so close you can't see it in the glare of sunlight, of course. And then a month later, tonight, there's dawn, actually. We have the moon again in that position, roughly between the Earth and the sun, within a degree or so. No eclipse, but again, it's called a black moon. Because, anyway, these are kind of arcane things, but they're definitely celestial. And we're looking at things far beyond the moon. I mean, some night we should do a whole show just on the moon. We could take one planet each night and show you astonishing things that the agencies have now found that they simply aren't telling anybody about. They're showing them, but they're not telling them. In fact, Keith earlier sent me an email. He said, you know, it's almost like they're waiting for us to tell people. So let's get back to telling people. Keith, I think you had the floor. Well, we were at the last part of the uh, uh, of talking about the first part of the Rosetta oh, the, 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 uh, the, the, epilogue the, video. Exactly, the film. So, Andrew, Andrew and, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Andrew. Yeah. Listen, before we go any further, Richard, I, I should also explain, um, just for those who haven't seen the original film, Ambition, mm -hmm. that it is a – it's like an homage. It's like a future homage back to – Essa's ambition to chase down a comet, a so-called comet, and then land a probe on it, which was the Philae lander, and then you know go into go into orbit and land this lander, and then eventually you know land down on top onto onto 67P. So it's kind of like a future look, future looking back on this whole this whole episode. So I just wanted to add that in there. People okay, really I, hang on, hang on. Before you get into the yeah. story, we got an update yes. from Will. Will's been monitoring. Up on the bridge, ESSA Communications, apparently the control room crew is now entered. They're putting the lander in a proper position for its crash landing. What do you got for us? All right. Uh, the, flight, the flight control team is now in the main control room, and they are updating the time to impact till 1038 UTC, which is exactly three wow. hours from now. The live feed goes uh, live in 22 minutes, which I will be watching and reporting back. You know, they had reported earlier it was going to land about 1040 Greenwich time. Now they're saying 1038, and they said it was a plus or minus 20 minutes. That's two minutes error from a day around this bizarre comet, which is not a comet, which has all kinds of internal gravity, uh, you know, nulls and valleys and 
things that can disturb the trajectory. So, I mean, that's pretty amazing prognostication uh, within two minutes, and they made that prediction days ago. It's pretty it's amazing. amazing. As it unfolds, I'll be back with you. Okay. So, back to Andrew. Okay, so we to go back, we're on radio with pictures under Andrew's items and under num- my number six, and we're now moving towards the bottom of this, what I call a photo board. So, in the story, and this is the way it is, the, the filmmakers describe it, um, this look up to the tree sort of triggers her – well, I'm, I'm thinking it triggers a memory. And then that's when we see the Rosetta probe sort of flying you know, through space. So this is where we're getting the connection now to the, to the probe. So go back to Radio with Pictures. Go to number seven. So under okay. my items, Andrew's items, you go to number seven. Okay. And – all right, so what she does here is she begins – we see a close-up on her, and she's now walking through the forest forward because she's basically decided, decided to return to the archives. And we sort of see this. You don't see it so much in this screenshot, but you can kind of see a ghosting effect um, as she approaches what, what soon will be um, this internal place. And then we, we trip over to the Rosetta spacecraft as it is seen approaching 67P. So we have this, this parallel. We have her approaching the archive. And then we have Rosetta approaching 67P. So once again, <laughs> yeah, right. Can they yeah. hit us over the head with it? Yeah, I know. And then the very next shot, she we're, we're behind her. We're, the, the camera's dolling with her. She enters the archives, the library. And then we see a POV shot, shot so a point of view shot. And what we see is a series of doorways, actually, a translucent enterings and two oh, pillars. My God. Three doorways, two yep. pillars. Three doorways, <sighs> two pillars. So remember, it's, uh, I've been telling you, they've been using duality and, and, uh, and triple concepts in this film the whole way. But, yeah. Yes. Go ahead, or uh, Keith. You wanted to add something to this, remember? Yes. Oh, no, uh, actually, no. But, I mean, this the, you you covered it just nicely. But I just want to notice they went, she goes in between two pillars. That's jo- right. Jo- you know, there you go. Jo- well, yes. L- hang on. Let's hit it on uh-huh. the head. What do you think the two pillars represent? What are the yeah. pillars? Well, it's Solomon's Temple. <laughs> it's, yes. It's, it's Bo- Joachim and yeah. Boaz, the two major yeah. temples in, in Masonry, in Freemasonry. They're telling us who's flying the mission, and what they're going to find. And it's going into a passage into the unknown. And Richard, the neoclassicism here, I mean, we, I, I know you could say, no, 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 the art directors are European, so they're, of course they're going to use European motifs, you know, high classicism. Again, all Greek and Roman architecture, but I'm saying, no, 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 no. This is, <laughs> this is going a lot deeper than just, um, you know, a remembrance of, of the Renaissance. Keith, you had a really good comment about, as she enters this, she, she makes her way – oh, by the way, she, she goes through an atrium, which is interesting. Okay. This is actually an atrium. Yeah, there's an atrium area, and then she makes her, her way. She moves through this door. She makes a right turn, and there she's in a what I call a grand gallery where she sees a projection of the 67P but in a highly crystalline form. Now, Keith, you brought up a couple of really good points that tie to – guess what? 2001. <laughs> so, Keith, please – yeah, if if you remember the if you remember the scene after Dave goes into the monolith, and then he's in this neoclassical room, uh, very similar to this. And there's there's columns, there's doorways. It's it's really similar, and the way it ties that part together. Uh, and then she walks up, and then there's this archive here. Uh, you know, that's. I mean, you know, the whole point of this was she returns to the archive. She walks into this archive, and there's 67 pieces. So what is this telling you? <laughs> it's, you know, it's like a hall of mirrors. You, know, yeah. you guys, the chandeliers, the crystal chandeliers, there's two of them. And it's, it's, called, it's light. It's the celestial city. This is a crystalline image. Richard, did you not say 67P is pitch black? Basically, like 2 3% reflectivity. It's carbon. It's ca- carbon nanotubes, actually. So it's yeah. incredibly black. It's like blacker than coal. It's so blacker than powdered this. charcoal. Yeah. And here it's it's white and it's 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 absolutely crystalline. This is Keith, our our celestial city, is it not? Straight out of the Vetus. Straight out of the Vetus. I mean. So let's let's move on to um number eight. So if you go back to radio with pictures and we'll we'll move a little quicker here. We'll get to number eight to my items. She has a knowing look. She looks up at this archive, remembers 
the explanation from her master from the first film. Again, people really need after the show to go to the to go. Well, they can take a link through here, and by joining nineteen club nineteen point five, they not only can see the links because they're all in a nice cozy place, but they can also um, earn some money as well. So please look into that. Uh, so she has a knowing look across her face, and she begins to walk towards another opening, and what we see is a fresco with two male figures, and this is a fascinating thing. This is a fascinating detail, and there's lots of details. But, Richard, there is no there is no doubt that every single detail in this film has been absolutely put in here deliberately. And, Kinthea, I, I, um, you wanted to add something about this, about these, these um, characters, right? Oh, did she go Kinthea, away? Kinthea, on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I was on mute. I wanted to add some of uh, M's messages, our dear producer. Um, so she's mentioning here the master being the, being the female here is the reflective divine feminine, persistent creative power. The past is the masculine brute force, even with a little loincloth. Well, we're coming up on that, so I'll, I'll hold back there. Yeah. And, I, and I'm Sorry. having a strange experience in that suddenly I can't connect to the site, but that's all right. I remember the images and I yeah. have, her. yeah. Okay. Go, go, go click on today's show. That's a backdoor entry into the, into the site. Cause I think we're just yeah. being overwhelmed with visitors. Oh, yeah. this is, is good. Yes. On. We have traffic. We have lots of traffic. So it I was did the able... same thing to me. I refreshed and it came back. So yeah. Just I was oh, able to get, in. Okay. Yeah, get so in, Keith, get in through today's show. Yes, Keith. Keith, can you can you add your layers now to what we're seeing in this in these what we are we're calling the twins? Well, yeah, it's Castor and Pollux. It, it, it symbolizes duality. Do you see how they're turned away from, but also towards each other? And then do you see the uh, do you see the spiral above their head of the two snakes? Uh, Going to, yep. uh, that are, they're intertwined. Uh, that is the that is the very concept of quantum physics. Uh, and you know. And it's the double helix. Yeah, it's the it? double helix also. Yes, it's life also. You, you see so many things portrayed there. Uh, and uh, you, then, she, then she turns and looks into this gateway. Uh, yeah. And the, the and, gateway is reflective. And it, yeah. shows, it shows three reflections of her. Uh, and each one of them is different if you look at it. It's, it's very strange. Okay, only, so I uh, – go ahead, Andrew. I wanted to add one more thing before we go past the twins. The twins, Castor, what is it? Castor and Castor. Pollux. Castor and Pollux. They become the um, the uh, Gemini, and they also bec- they are worshipped as the gods who helped shipwreck sailors, and they would bring good winds to the sailors when sacrifices were made. And this is the point. Oh. The spaceship. Yes, the spaceships that we're hmm. seeing on 67P <laughs> are sacrifices. Yeah. So please go ahead. Cynthia, please. With the- yeah, no, I'm just going to add some more of M's comments here. So she says the masculine, the two. Now we're still on. We're, fresco- we're, we're, hang on, we're still on number eight on on um, Andrew's uh, storyboard, right? Yes, and we've moved down now to our master, our female master, who, who interesting enough, enough is feminine and female, and she is now standing at a, some sort of opening, which has obviously got some cover on it, and we're seeing her reflection three times, and they're different in each image. Well, you realize, of course, why she has to be feminine. This is the year of ISIS. This is why Hillary has to be president. This is why Trump is the worst candidate in history, because she has to be, as part of this ritual, she has to be president. It's the year of the feminine, the divine feminine, in their perception. Yeah. Cynthia? Okay, so are we on number eight now? Yep. Panel yes. number eight? All right, so... Um, the masculine duo are inclined toward each other under snakes. The snakes symbolize one, kundalini, the divine feminine creative power, or shakti energy, or two, the unfinished caduces. The masculine without the feminine, thinking it unnecessarily, unnecessary, clearly are trying to complete human evolution, kundalini, or the symbol the caduces, to be the cure, but are met with destruction. The master understands the symbol. It is a museum for a reason. The masculine 
dismisses the feminine to its detriment. Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when we move in, another thing I wanted to add, Richard, is we're seeing this three, and Keith brought this up earlier. We're seeing the Godhead again. You know, I mean, an example would be Christianity, the Father, yes. the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In, in Hinduism, there's Brahma, the creator God, Vishnu, the protector God, and Shiva, the destroyer. So we're seeing the symbology in multi-cultures right <laughs> now. Well, Absolutely. they're just they're just letting it all hang out for whoever can decode it, whoever can see through yeah. the mirrors. Yeah, that's right. So let's go back to the picture. So we're again on number eight. We're moving down the photo board. We now see Rosetta beginning its ascent to the surface of 67P. So in the image, we see the the, um, the probe starting to go down. The final well, one of the final shots is 67P tumbling through space as it travels once more into its long elliptical orbit back out into the fur further reaches of the solar system. There are two more shots. It says in in the film, it says in September 2016, Rosetta's journey ends. The next shot is we continue ours. Now listen. 67P rotating in that image then gives way to the final shot. And Keith, what is that final shot doing? It's a spiral dolly, mm -hmm. <laughs> just like it's tumbling and coming to right itself with the two pillars. In other words, because of that camera move and that spiral dolly, we're just like 67P was tumbling, we're tumbling our way back to you know, a, a firm footing here. Well, the origin yeah. is a, the tree symbol is origins. It's roots, yes. literal roots. They're saying mm -hmm. we did not come from here. An homage to our real history. Like if they were on the program tonight, they could not be plainer. Yeah. yeah. Richard, or uh, Keith, did you want to add anything on that one, that last one? Oh, well, it sounds like our... Uh, we continue ours, and then they show us the same archive yes. that she walked through. <laughs> yeah, that was Correct. tumbling. It was tumbling. <laughs> yes. Just like, exactly. So how many more times can we tie it together? Right. So it's we're, up we're, to us. Yeah. Right. You know what? And does anybody remember uh, Holger Sirix, who is the PI of Rosetta, uh, had an image in the image of the yes. day archive of him standing <laughs> in his in his clean suit behind the glass door oh, with a finger so pushing, and, and the door said access forbidden, and he was fixing to open it with this with this wry look on his face. Oh my God! <laughs> I, yeah, so you know, the, the, I don't. I, we expect nothing less from these ultra smart. Oh. Beautiful people. I mean, this is wonderful oh. what they've done here. And, uh, the, you know, this is designed so that those that see can see and those that mm -hmm. don't will never. And, and uh, you know, that's the beauty of this. I mean, uh, you know, people say we want it, we want it plain or we want disclosure. And I'm like, well, we don't need disclosure. It's right in front of us. It's yeah. right here. You, yeah. They already put it. It's just like you said, Richard. They're just going to throw it all out there. And, oh, well, oh, is it for real? <laughs> yes, it is. I, Richard, and I Keith, you, oh, go, go ahead. No, you, you finish. Cause I All right, well, what I was going to say is that, Keith, like you're touching on the thing here that they're putting it out there for let those who have eyes see. So now more and more we're beginning to access the field more consciously, and that's the archive, the field of consciousness. It's becoming more available to more of humanity. And it's something that's waking up from within. It's not a linear type of event. It's like going from bl seeing in black and white to seeing in color. And as a species, we are waking up to our ancient memories. And that's where this film is ending there, where you're seeing the archive, the, which is the doorway to those ancient memories. And Richard, I want to add one more thing. If we could go back to Radio with Pictures and you scroll down and Emma's kindly put um, a link under under my final number eight. And it is the making of the film Ambition. So the one before the breakdown we just did. But listen, towards the end, and everybody must again watch this as well, the making of. Because Richard, at the very end of this small little film, the um, – the simulations expert, he's uh, one of the special effects guys. His name is – and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mangle his name, but Lukacs Sobitz. Um, he's this, called the simulations expert for this company called Platige Image. 
and that's the company that created the film. Anyways, listen mm-hmm. to this. I, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read what he what he says because it's 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 um, dubbed over in English on the bottom. The actual campaign idea is certainly well targeted, and we need a great director, film, and actors to convince people this is interesting. But shooting myself in the foot a bit, mankind sends a probe into space to catch a comet and land on it. I'm surprised you need something like this at all now. They don't even know why they're doing this film. <laughs> <laughs> well, do Honestly, they, or they, is this an incredible, you know, uh, kabuki theater thing? Mm. I mean, it just seems to me, unless this is so unconscious and so modulated by the physics, so that like minds are entrained in the same memories and symbology, there's got to be secret planning here. I mean, the whole Masonic imagery, they're saying, this is who we are, this is who we, who owns this, you're going through our doorway to our past. Yeah. Absolutely. Disagreement? Agreement? Totally agree. <laughs> okay. Totally agree. See, to me, this is a setup for when they have to... It's not going to... It's not going to crystallize like a super cool fluid until there is some kind of official announcement. I think what they're doing is loading the archives so when there is this spark and it goes viral and people go, holy cow, look what's out there, they can say, well, we didn't know. Amazing! With all the rest of us. (laughs) It's called political deniability and they'll get away with it. Look at what Trump has gotten away with. <laughs> we, we've got a uh, we've got a, a break in from the news desk. The live feed is now going. You can see the people funneling in and out of the uh, pretty neat room they've got here set up. So we are now live and waiting. So anybody who has that live feed up, Richard, I know you had it tied in. You wanted to bring it up a little bit here and yeah, there. Yeah, I want to go anything. back to the top and let me. Oh, I see it there. Yes. Oh, wonderful. If, and in fact, if there's anything good, I'll tell you. Yeah, you know, somebody. I was having this weird noise, a voice in my ear, and I was thinking, "Up, oh, I'm losing it." <clears throat> then someone said, "Why don't you check the feed?" So it's it's the feed. I have the feed way up, and they had some kind of a little intro. So we'll turn that down. Will you'll keep an eye on that if they pop up any kind of a monitor. This impact actually is not going to be an impact. Anybody want to take a, take up the idea of how this thing is actually going to quote crash? Or be sacrificed? If it crashes at all? Well, they, they, they basically is on a descent impact trajectory. It's not going to miss the comet, so it's going to land. The question is how hard, and then what happens? Well, it's a pretty it's a pretty big craft, and it's got great big old long solar panels. And when it hits, something's going to break, even if it's just going, a, you know, a, at minimum velocity. And it will be going at minimum velocity, but they don't expect it to survive, you know, the the, the crash. But it would be really neat if it would come to rest on, on the surface and still mm-hmm. take a few pictures, you know. Well, remember but, when? But, the, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what if the um... Uh, actually are trying to uh, uh, land it, but they only told us that they would uh, send it down and crash it. Well, I, I don't think that's realistic because, again, this thing is made for space, deep space. It's it's solar panels were something like a football field wide. They're as wide as that pit, 300 feet. And when this thing comes down, even at walking speed, it's going to flop. It's going to bounce like Beli did. It's a, there's no gravity. So there's no controllability. So the high-gain antenna is not going to remain pointed at the Earth. And then the thermal properties are going to go to hell with it sitting in all that black dust. It's going to get covered with dust. The thermal properties are going to go through the roof. It's going to die of thermal shock or lack of energy, lack of solar power, or lack of batteries, or lack of, you know, in other words, a whole bunch of stuff. No, this is a sacrifice because they, as part of the succeeding epic of civilizations, stretching off to the horizon. We can see the craft on the surface. We're the last of a a line of Mohicans stretching into the distance that have all done this. The question is, what do they get out of doing this this way? Great question, Thomas, because I had the uh, the same one in my head, too. (laughs) Mm, We never know what they will do, and we don't trust them for sure 
for what they're telling us. <laughs> but boy, those solar panels are huge. I'm looking at some of those things, Richard. You're dead on. There's nothing. Something's going to break on it, no matter. What. Oh, there's nothing. Remember when they landed? I forget the name of the spacecraft on Eros. It was much more compact because it was much closer to the sun when they rendezvoused, and they actually were able to to maintain uh, communication. But it wasn't a ritual. This is a ritual. They literally are sending the you know suicide command to the computer. So when it feels the shock of landing, it turns everything off. Because they don't want the radio signal to mess up other stuff. By the way, speaking of radio <laughs> signals, I know you're reading my mind, Will. <laughs> it's that time. It's that time. And we got three <laughs> minutes. Well, two minutes. Okay. We've been uh, – and, and as, as the new pictures are coming back, if everybody wants to also have our Facebook page up the other side of midnight, I'm, I'm putting them under this link. Um, under the link for today's show, along with a lot of questions are being asked out there as well. So I've been manning that and putting the new pictures out on there for people to see. Okay, send me some of the best questions because I'll feed those to the panel or tackle one or two myself if we if we if we get to that part. Are we going to wait till after the, the break in the top of the hour? Yeah, let's wait to play this common music because I want to go and I want to kind of dissect the the so-called music of sixty seven P that they released almost two years ago when they got here. And just before, in November of last year, I think, before they separated the little feli lander, they they gave us this little chunk of music, or plasma interactions, as they're technically called. And mm-hmm. it's it's so bizarre when you play them because, well, let's not give it away. For those folks that are new in the audience who have not heard this before, when we come back in about 30 seconds... We'll play you this bizarre recording that Rosetta picked up on the night before it was going to land us at a lander, and they put it out. They published it, almost like it's another part of the message. Here on the other side of midnight, my guest this morning, my imaging panel, we're looking at the live landing, live narration of the landing of the Rosetta spacecraft on the surface of what looks to be an ancient human interstellar probe. Maybe, maybe not. We shall return. Oh, that is so nice. M really has a talent for picking out music. This is from a group called The Killers, but it's called Spaceman. You know, it seems like it's, it's this, this thing with almost everybody now feels and gets that we're part of this incredible long parade. And it's just waiting for something to crystallize it so it's verbalized around the world. I mean, thoughts, anybody? And don't everybody speak at once? Well, it's definitely permeating. Right now, there's at least 11,000 people watching the uh, grand finale for this time. You know, this is uh, that it keeps coming up and up and more. So there's so many people interested in it. Did you want me to play the sing- the singing comet? See if you could hear it through my. Uh... Yeah. Why don't we try the the the, the comet sounds that were recorded on the approach uh, last year? These, These are, are actual sounds. sounds, amplified and then accelerated in time. In other words, they've been sped up in frequency, but the rhythmic frequency has been maintained. So it's merely been accelerated and you'll hear something quite mm-hmm. extraordinary oh and richard recall that uh the they didn't hear this until they got within 100 kilometers of the that's comet. right it almost like it was a proximity thing and it turned on exactly. when rosetta got close enough to trigger an alarm you ready will yep. now this is actual sounds recorded by a device on the spacecraft called the plasma experiment And what's so astonishing is listen to the regularity.
that is real. That is an actual electromagnetic recording of the sounds of the comet made by this instrument on Rosetta when it approached, as Keith said, within about 100 miles. It suddenly was not there, and then it was there, and we've not heard any signal since. We have no idea what happened to the signal, do we? Never heard a word about it. But no, there was said, zero follow-up. Nope. Pretty weird. Again, it's almost like they put everything out there so that we can assemble the picture without them telling us what the picture is. It's, it's the craziest thing. My animals go crazy when I play that. That's probably the third time I've played that here. Every cat in the house is going nuts. Well, maybe, they get, maybe they're understanding it. Maybe it says, we are your masters. We have returned. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because what, what are the messages is, in it? Uh, is there anybody that uh, is wise enough to decode it? Uh, tell us well, what we, it look, we got all kinds of algorithms. Just stick the damn thing in a computer and see what, in addition to the rhythmic tones, the background is doing, because it changes background pitches and frequency and all that. Very oh, strange. All right, yeah. all right hold it there. It hold it there. It, it, hang on, hang on, You can feel guys. it all the way down your spine. We're at five after the hour, three-minute break. You're on the other side of midnight. Very interesting panel here and what's going to happen next. Don't go away. We shall return. And listen to that one on the other side of midnight. It's a Friday morning coming up on the end of the week. Kind of chilly and clammy and dampy here in the land of enchantments in the upper 60s. Sorry, Patrick, and you've got that black moon, so you're not going to see any moon tomorrow. But the day after you will, so hang in there. So, um, Will, we got an update from Essa. All right, right now the live feed seems to be having a black screen, not much going on on their Twitter and their Facebook pages. They just released the 8.9 kilometer images, which I have went ahead and linked on the other side of Midnight Facebook page under today's show. So as they come in, I'll be posting them. Okay, and again, if people want to join Facebook or Twitter in the conversation, and see some astonishing images. Uh, we have more bandwidth over there, so we're going to do that. Uh, just go to the upper left-hand corner of the other side of midnight.com. Click on those item icons. I can say that right. It's still Mercury retrograde, so my my, my speaking ability sometimes is impaired during Mercury retrograde. So anyway, those two icons. Click on them and join Facebook. And so, what's the status right now with the spacecraft? Um, as of right now, they have no more status. Um, I'm surprised. They've got over 11,000 people watching now and uh, just to black screen. So people are still interested, aren't, aren't turning away from it. Uh, but it is moving. It's on the. Uh, it's gone from 11 kilometers out to 8.9. So it's making its descent. Wow. Well, as it gets closer and closer, the images are going to show more and more and more stuff. So let's talk about stuff. Who wants to jump in and talk about stuff? Kintia? Yes, I'd love to. If you'd go to Radios with Pictures, my first image, please. Okay. We're there. Okay, so at the top you see a detail from one of Keith's magnificent gigapans, and I'm liking it to this YouTube, uh, well, it's a, in 2001, um, off the coast of India, the History Channel is reporting that uh, there was a sunken landmass called Kumari Kandam. It's off the Gulf of Kambat. And you see there the three images of these of this ancient city, what it looks like now. And, you know, it's just almost unrecognizable. And when you look at the image above from the so-called comet, or you look at the second image of Keith or the second image of Andrew, you're going to see features that look very much like this. And this this city is only 32,000 years old. So imagine what's going on at the comet and uh, spacecraft, I should say, that... You know, here the rigid forms that would normally be there have all sort of shifted with time and the erosion. And and so I just want to point out that, you know, we're not looking for features that are going to be identifiable, obviously. And so 
when you compare this ancient city that is nowhere near as old as what we're looking at on uh, 67P, it all makes sense that we are looking at ancient ruins. It's, it's um, Keith, I don't you know how, how else to say that. Well, I think that's kind of an agreement with all the rest of us. What's interesting to me is we all kind of like not talked about this among ourselves a lot, and certainly Kinthea is new to this, but the fact that you can look at this and see the hallmarks of artificiality, that is so affirming. That says to me that an awful lot of independent people, once they know there's something to look at, they're going to look at these images and they're going to see exactly what we see, and they're going to ask the same questions that we're asking. Uh, Keith, let's talk about your dome, because this afternoon when you sent me that image of the preceding era spacecraft, a succession of cultures obviously after the big, big, big one, the Type II millions of years ago, that have made this pilgrimage, you you noted that it, they all landed in this little area right next to this feature on the surface of this so-called comet, actually an ancient spacecraft, that you believe is the remnants of an ancient dome. Yeah, Imhotep Dome is actually what it is, because that's the, that's the area that it dominates. But, yeah. Uh, so where should we go? go? If you go to my image, go down to my section on Radio with Pictures, okay. and uh, go down to my image number three. It says Dom Comp under it. Number three. Got it. Okay. And then you see. click on it again to make it bigger uh-huh. or smaller. Well, and you and you see the stone. Yeah. Uh, also, control scroll works really well to zoom in and out on these pictures. Yeah. But uh, you see this. Uh, I mean, this thing is a great big hexagonal dome. I mean, we've been studying it for a long time, and obviously, uh, S is really interested in it because there's a bunch of images in the archive. Uh, they released a bunch of images uh, just yesterday, and we, I've been looking through them going, wow, and I didn't have time to prepare many of them for the show. But uh, what's in the what's in the ones that are already there are, is just stunning. If you look at the detail that's in this dome, you, you see this is wreckage. It's, uh, yeah, it's plain and simple. You see geometry, three. Uh, geometry, geometry, geometry. Yeah, so you're looking it's, at mechanical stuff, mechanical junk. Well, you know, and if they if they are landing these spacecraft to visit, what better place to go? I mean, when you're flying around this thing, you cannot miss this dome. It's on the large lobe on the very end. You, you can't miss it as the thing's tumbling under you. And so what better place to look? And if you look on this image above the dome, you see the little uh, – look up in the left-hand corner. On the black and white big image of the dome, it's uh, okay. It's actually on the it's it's like a little three strip of images where I have a synthesized dome laid over top of it. Right. On the go right to the very side. top. Im- yeah, go to the top image of that, and you'll see the dome there. And you'll if you look up, you'll on the top left hand corner of that, you'll see the little areas. That's where those. That's where that craft image came from. Is that little area that's up in the left-hand corner of that? Well, this thing has a hexagonal base, which means it might have been tetrahedral. Well, I think the hexagon was A. C. Clark's actual monolith. You know, that's that's what I think. The, no, 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 no. The, there was a private the conversation. Thing- hang on, hang on. There's a private conversation I had between him and Kubrick back in 1965, and I've got it as an actual. Um, I forget the artist's uh, name. You might know it, Andrew. He did. Uh, was it Bill McCauley, McAuliffe, McCauley? Anyway, he did a lot of art sketches for 2001. The original monolith was supposed to be a gigantic tetrahedron, just like that little spaceship lying on the surface of 67P in your new craft images you sent me this afternoon. Yeah, that's amazing. When that thing turns it up and uh, you can see the stuff that's really down there, it's something else. Uh, uh, but yeah, this this dome has been intriguing me, you know, since the beginning. I you know I saw it in the images and you know, I couldn't ignore it. I mean, there's a great big hexagon, and you know that's akin to the uh, to South Massif on the moon, which is a great big hexagon. So uh, you know we see a lot of these things that are hexagonal. A matter, matter of fact, this whole comet is eaten up with hexagons. Mm. I would like to uh, I would like to draw attention to. I saw something that Bob put up. I'd like to go to one of his images and show something real quick. Okay. Because uh, and Bob has been uh, incredibly silent over there in the Atlantic. You have to speak up, Robert. Yeah, 
crash the server again. I don't I don't have pictures, but Baba, go over that Im- image that you have that has the hexagons on it. That is amazing. Okay. Right, thanks, Keith. The the website is crash uh, or is yeah. slow to load for me at the moment. Yeah. Uh, if, That's good. Uh, if people go, if people do, oh, it's come up now. If people go to uh, to my items, Robert's items, um, and uh, item four. Item four. Okay. I've still only got a grey screen at the moment, but I, I can remember it. Basically, um, as Keith says, there's a lot of hexagonal depressions. Oh my gosh! Yes, yes. Hexagonal depressions on Comet 67P, and what I've done is I've taken uh, the diagram that, or the illustration that uh, Keith has done of a hexagonal dome for his dome and imagined it being domes like that being over those hexagonal depressions on mm. on um, 67p and at the very top uh, i still haven't got it here on my uh, computer moment but at the very top i've shown another image that keith uh, had discovered um, of a an asteroid with a, a dome city on it um, so the idea is just to bring together these elements of uh, Keith's work on the on his dome, uh, those hag- hexagonal, uh, that p- particular dense clutch, clutch of hexagonal uh, depressions, a uh, bit of uh, Andrew's artwork into one poster to 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 give uh, a conceptual idea of uh, 67p as uh, perhaps a natural object, but heavily altered surface. I don't and think this we... is natural. I think it but... was all, all made. And they, they may have wrapped an artificial thing around a core of ice, you know, for mm-hmm. water and hydrogen and other or organics or something like that. But I think mm-hmm. most of this thing is artificial because we see artificial but... geometry everywhere we look. Oh, yes. The surface is probably being, uh, you know, you think of artificiality completely covering the surface. Uh, but what we'd be seeing now are basically the foundations and footings of what was there before. You know, as this thing falls... Uh, so have very, very heavily ruined. As this thing falls like a feather, think of it as floating down like a feather. That's how fast it's falling. Falling isn't really the right term. They've got a camera. they got two cameras that have incredible... Uh, optics, and they're going to take picture after picture after picture and send them back in real time because they get all the antennas all aligned and they're falling straight down. At some point, these black screens, is it possible they're seeing things that they're freaking out about and they don't want to show us in real time? Nice if you were, wouldn't it? (laughs) I mean, are they really that dumb, a lot of them, that they don't get what's been going on, what they've been looking at for two years? But if they wanted to hide it, then why would they have made the the film ambition? You know, it's like they're saying, look at it. Well, but wait, wait. When we say they, remember, not everybody in an organization knows as much as everybody else. Mm-hmm. So you can work like a worker bee and have no clues to what's going on. The guys mm-hmm. that did the film, Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong, but they used incredibly accurate and precise symbology and art and camera moves and all that to convey... An archive message. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Everything from the from the camera moves. I mean, you could argue that first opening shot with the dead tree is just like you said, Richard, an artistic framing of a foreground object to give us more depth perception, etc. But no, 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 no. <laughs> There's a lot <laughs> of layering going on there. So this is the symbolic story. What they think they found, which is an archive to their own past, the dead tree. The it's always cold under another star in the morning. I mean, good grief, who wrote that line? Uh, and the, the lyrics for the music that's going on at the time is is really uh, it says there's a place behind a tiny door where there are the, where where there are vines and even roses and you know more and then I, it goes on. But yeah, yeah I, that's, can, I can lift the thorns so so you can feel again. Yeah. And press them in your in your hand or in your, your skin. skin. Yeah. We start to bleed again. I mean, come on. <laughs> we'll start to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just amazing. Hey, can uh, I uh, ask a question here? Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, because I would like to go back to uh, Kia's picture number three with the dome. I was just sitting and, and uh, enhancing it a little bit, and uh, mm. <laughs> I am truly amazed because during the show, through... Thomas is enhancing one of Keith's pictures <laughs> yeah, because I that's how obsessed something. all these guys are. When they see something amazing, they gotta go for it. They'll say, "Which which image what? now are we what looking at?" And I'm actually doing it on my tablet here because I am trying to record the uh, live stream from ESA here at the same time. Uh, <laughs> Okay. So, if you go to Keith's picture number three, the dome comp, the dome comp, yeah, and take uh, the picture in the bottom, there are a top picture and the bottom picture, and from the left to the right, go one third of the picture in, about halfway down, there is a, a big rock that has a light white top, if you can see that one, mm -hmm. and just to the left of that big rock, there is another rock about one third of the size. And if you zoom in, and I'm doing this on my little tablet here, uh, I will guarantee you it what you are looking at here is <laughs> something that looks like writings on it, yes. and it's crystal clear. Who, who, yes, who it has that? letters on it. It has letterings. Mm. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> Yes, it has, and I am amazed, and I'm sitting, I can see a D, I can see an F, I can see a Y, and I can see something that looks like an S and an N, and that is a little bit blurry, but I would say clear enough to see. Now, obviously, is. right there, you're going to be raising all kinds of questions for people who say, wait a minute, English letters on a comic? Well, they're not that's... really, they're not really, they're, they're, they're different. If you look closely, they're not English, they're different. Okay, but, but they are framed like letters. Were sort of like a sort of like a tail number would be on an airplane. Um, you know. I can guarantee you, when I come back from from work uh, after this show here, I will uh, enlarge this, uh, enhance this picture. And well, it's not <laughs> only it that, just, but the uh, big rock, the big rock that you started off from, that's right, that's just to yeah, the right of that. Yes. Uh, look at that. Well, why does it have a turkey tail and a spiral on the front of it, and a mm -hmm. uh, what is that on the top of it? it yeah, this uh, the whole mm -hmm. image. This you can spend days in this one image, and I have a gigapan <laughs> of this yeah. that's called up close and personal. It's in my uh, uh, 67p uh, gallery at Gigapan. Uh, mm -hmm. Look through it; it's awesome. It it puts this mm -hmm. image to shame. It, it you can really see the letters. This, this yeah. image is loaded with anomalies. For all of you out there, we, we will uh, put the uh, Keith Gigapan uh, at least on the UFA page on, on Facebook, and you can go download it. And I will guarantee you, you can spend hours just looking at it and be fascinated of what you can find of uh, images of uh, anomalies on, on this. Okay, Keith, image. you have an image number seven called the stairs, and that's kind of our flag image tonight. It's on the homepage of the other side of midnight. You want to kind of talk about that? Because then I'll talk about a detail on this image, which I think is compelling in terms of an ancient visit. Well, I mean, uh, I, I named this the stairs because I like to give creative little names to the things I find that are not too controversial. But if you look at it, that's what it's reminiscent of. It's, it's broken layer upon layer upon layer of structure. And, it's, and it displays geometry three uh, that we love to see in everything. And uh, it's just an amazing image. It's another one of those that you can get lost in and stay in for hours. And uh, uh, it does have particular details along the top. And uh, I don't want to steal your thunder, so you go right ahead. <laughs> it's, <Rich>. it's okay. <laughs> so if you click on it, it gets bigger. Scroll to the very top, and you'll see that I I, I rotated it so that vertical is vertical. There's a interesting kind of bright teardrop-shaped object, medium size, sitting right next to what looks to be a cliff. And then if you go back to Radio with Pictures and you get out of this image and you scroll up to my images, and this is a little slow because we've got a lot of people looking right now. That's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. Uh, okay. Uh, nope, it didn't let me do that. There's too many people looking. Okay, mm -hmm. we're going to have to increase our bandwidth because you can't do Radio with Pictures unless you have pictures. Very difficult. Okay, so let me try to go in through another doorway here. All right. Anyway, if you go up to one of my pictures, you'll see that there's a close-up of this object. And, in fact, it looks like one of the pods 
out of the um, uh, hangar bay in the Discovery spacecraft that was in 2001. I mean, it just looks astonishing. It looks like a like a spacecraft that literally has been, um, and I have to go back in, that has been parked there waiting for what? And I'm trying to log back onto the page because we have an awful lot of people on the page. It's really taking a lot of time. Yeah. Could we discuss um, Keith's item number one at some time, Richard? Uh, yes, let's do that because I can't get in. So someone who's already in, take over. That's the spike, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, describe this. Well, the spike is a, it's a, basically what I call it. It's a black thing that's sticking up about 25 yards out of the surface, casting a shadow. And it's it's on two images uh, that I've seen in Rosetta so far, and probably countless more if I dig through the archives, which is going to happen because they've been flooding the images in there really quick and uh, not releasing them. But now they're going to release all of them, and they'll all be in there. We'll be able to pour through them and see if this thing. I want, when I first saw it, I thought it might be a. I thought it might be a, a defect in the camera lens, mm -hmm. uh, and then I, you know, especially when I saw it on two. But as I'm looking through, a yeah, defect on the camera lens will be on all images from that particular of camera, course. and it's only on the ones that uh, that are taking a picture of the item. So it, it's definitely there on the surface. It's casting a shadow that corresponds directly with the with the angle of the sunlight falling on it in in every picture. There are three now. I've got two highlighted on this. Uh, particular image but uh, I was looking because they're releasing images as they're doing this uh, you know uh, crash in or sacrifice and uh, so uh, I found a brand new one just you know as we're starting the show okay hang on uh, hang on we're at the closer. bottom of the hour my guest this morning my imaging panel on the other side of midnight.com go there click on Facebook and Twitter join the conversation send me a question I'll get to back to some of those when we come back we shall return. Don't go away. Okay, we are back on the other side of midnight. One half hour to go. If you want to join the conversation live on the air with Essa giving us updates in the background, we're going to go back to Essa shortly and find out what's going on. You can call us on Skype, 505-796-8802, 505-796-8802, or Enterprise Mission or the other side of midnight. Will, what's going on over at Essa? All right. As of right now, they keep uh, they're changing images. They're basically haven't put any new ones out. We're at eight point nine still on theirs. They put a cute little uh, <laughs> they put a cute little comet landing uh, cartoon out. But other than that, we're just waiting. It looks like more and more people are coming in. Um, and wait for some more news. Hmm. Okay. So, who else wants to jump in? Well, I, would I like just to... want... Go ahead. Go ahead, Derek. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I would like to talk about one of the pictures, if it's okay with you here. Because I was looking at uh, one of my own pictures, uh, uh, picture number two. Okay. And now I have to... Uh... So hang on. We have to go back to Radio with Pictures. We scroll down to Thomas's Items, which is under Keith. Keep going. Keep going. Under Andrew's... Under Roberts. Almost at the bottom. There we are. There yeah. we are. Almost at the bottom. Okay. Thomas's yeah. items. And, and, and take picture number two. Number two. I, uh, I was looking at that and I was thinking, oh boy, what, what are we looking at? Because there is this round object sitting in in, 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 in something that looks like, uh, and this is just a term, <laughs> a giant uh, mechanical spider or something. I don't know how to say it in English. No, you know what it looks, it looks like? like? No, 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 some, no, no. Thomas, Thomas. That's it looks, the dome. It looks like, it, no, it looks, well, from this angle, it looks to me like the bow of the Titanic with the cranes still aloft. In other words, it looks like a mechanical thing that's an incredible ruin. But the lines oh, show. 
Go ahead. Yeah, that's that is the dome. I, I guarantee you. I've been looking. I've been studying this thing from all angles, okay. all the way around this com. That is the dome. We're looking. At, you're looking at the little side wall that you can see yeah, in my yeah, yeah. In, in my large image, and what you're seeing protruding of the top. Uh, uh, what you're th- seeing protruding from the top is actually sticking up there. When you when yeah. we're looking from an upper view, looking down on it, you don't see that. But the perspective shots from the side show that stuff. And also, there's there are mounds that are beyond it too, and we're seeing some of that too. But the the stuff down on the ends, mm-hmm. that's actually standing up there. I didn't realize we were looking at the same because I think yours was from, from a slight different angle. Yes. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is so great that, that, that two people or more are looking at the same object and pointing it out. <laughs> well, look, man, something, of what we are looking at here. <laughs> something's but, drawing attention to it, see? It's just yeah. like that beacon that it let out at, at, at 100 kilometers. It's drawing your attention to it. It's, it, it does not look natural at all. By the way, Will, Will um, uh, Keith had some interesting reactions to that music. Can you play, can you put, put up the music for the comet again? And I want, Keith, I want you to describe in real time as that's playing your reaction to that. Because I think that might be intended. I think maybe... You know, we're all thinking right brain, communication, hieroglyphics, information. What if this communication was at a much deeper torsion level to resonate with consciousness itself? That is one of the most reverberating sounds. And as it goes up and down in frequency, if you're sitting and focusing on it, you can feel it move up and down your nervous system, or your, you know, go up and down your spine. Uh, you know, and I'm a meditator, uh, so I know what it feels like when my chakras are being lit up. And this does it. Chilling. Yeah, that high pitch focuses right almost... Almost in your medulla. Wow. It's amazing. So there's two or more sets of modulation going on. There's the background rhythm, and then there's the modulation of the rhythm and the change of the frequency of the modulation of the rhythm. And then it ends it off by running all the way up and down the whole range of them. Did you hear that? Yeah. Uh, and I could feel that go from the top of my, spot, you know, from the from my crown. You know, okay. So down. as as this Probably. football <laughs> as this football field craft gently floats like a feather, closer and closer, sinking vertically toward this two and a half mile wide, multi pronged object. What is it picking up now? So as it gets below a certain altitude, will another set of signals go off? Will it be able mm-hmm. to record them and send them back to Earth in time before it turns off? Well, hey, let and me make and an what's the impact of everyone listening to this at the same time all around the planet? Are we all being tuned to a frequency as we're all listening to this simultaneously? Oh, that's right out of uh, Independence Day. <clears throat> It's a signal mm-hmm. using our satellite, well, so you've got to pay attention, Mr. President. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, you know what? They're, they're flying Rosetta really softly into this thing. Oh, yeah. Well, they want it to survive. Uh, now, it now, has to be an icon. It has to sit there. It has to be a structure. Well, uh, when have they ever done that? When, uh, when, when the soft landing on Eros for the, the spacecraft that was named, oh, they renamed it after, um, oh, what's his name? Oh, I can't remember the darn spacecraft name. But they did soft land the, the bus, what they call the, the bus, the spacecraft that carries things to other places. They mm. landed the bus. It was solar-powered. The panels were much smaller than Rosetta. But they were able to successfully soft land it. And then the Omni antennas kept transmitting to Earth. So they got gamma ray readings. They got temperature readings. They got a bunch of readings when they weren't supposed to. But with Rosetta, they're not going to try that at all. They're, they're going to have it turn itself off so it becomes a silent monument to us. Rosetta just put out a new tweet. It says that the operations manager, passive visitation commands have been confirmed and executed. 
SW Pats is live. No turn it back. Number Comet Landing. So we are on route. Hmm. And the uh, the landing slash impact is in what uh, three and a half hours, something like that. They are still saying it's going to be yes at twenty eight after um, UTC. So, but that's about probably two and a half hours now or two hours. Yeah, it's about four twenty our time. So it's two forty now. So. Okay, um, images, back to images. Um, we had some astonishing stuff there, guys, and I think Will has got an image. One image, an image tonight. I could, one I brought one image. image. Okay. First time. You know, I had to get sold on 67P. This was one of the ones really? that I haven't made videos on. I just was kind of you never read my put You never read together. my Pluto book. <clears throat> you should have read the Pluto book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, scroll down to Will's items. All right. Oh, my God, one little lone item there between Robert and uh, Andrew. Okay. I know that that's a first. Now, this was found by uh, – this was on my website. It was found by a buddy, Joe White. They called it the Tower, and just kind of out there in the middle of nowhere. Oh, my God. This was from September 24th, I think, is when it was uh, – no, oh. 09. Okay, it was 2014. Um, in September, it came down, and I basically all I did was uh, turn it 25 degrees counterclockwise, just so you could see it standing up how it would be. But uh, just kind of lone sitting there. I don't know actual scale on it, but it sure is interesting. Well, if if uh, Keith's rod or spire or whatever you're calling it, a uh, shard, is 25 meters, that's three times. That's what 150 feet, something like that. This thing has got to be at least as tall, if not bigger. You know what it looks like, Will? It looks like one of those round towers in uh, Scotland or Ireland that were built by monks in the ninth century. And they're, they're Callahan has investigated. They have incredible hyperdimensional properties because they're basically an obelisk. They resonate to the torsion field. If that thing isn't eroded, if that thing is like something original, it could be one of those. And the top looks like a different color as well, kind of, kind of turned well, a little bit darker. Well, yeah, it's dark. I mean, this is black and white. So, <clears throat> anybody yeah. else? Yeah, this is definitely a, a great picture because if you look just in front of the tower, now I have enlarged it on my tablet again. Looking just in front of that tower, there is uh, something almost square construction, uh, not complete square, but almost. Uh, and it looks like it has windows, window frames in it. <laughs> oh, doesn't it? Doesn't it? It looks like some kind of rotunda. You yeah, can almost like see these a building that has been standing out there for a few thousand years. Uh, or, or you know, oh, this is going to be cool, guys. What if this is like the um, um, uh, tower in Seattle, and this used to be the rotating restaurant up on the top? Oh yeah. And it's now <laughs> lying on the ground next to it because the gimbals broke. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Rosetta Restaurant, Eden the Sky. Even the wow. Sky. <laughs> okay, again, Facebook, if you want to get a question in, Greg Ahrens has an interesting question. He says, for new listeners, please go over the problems of outgassing into the vacuum of space, but with straight-line jets of gas and dust versus a cloud of dust. In other words, I think he's addressing the idea of these pits. And remember, our model is these are not excavations due to sunlight melting surface ice these are constructions like huge viaducts they're like the plumbing system by the way anybody mm -hmm. want to guess um let's let, you know we got a few minutes till the end of the show anybody want to guess what those bumps on that tower or that 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 tunnel we're going to be descending and taking incredible high resolution images of in the next uh two hours actually might be well, you know what, Richard, speaking of those bumps, I have something really, really similar. Uh, if you go up to uh, my images, and it's image number five, okay. it says 9115 on it. Okay, got to go back. Uh, by the way, people are trying to call in, and I'm not getting any connections. It doesn't add to group call, so you have to update your Skypes, folks. You know, we all updated our Skype before we did the show tonight, because if you don't update, you can't be in residence and you can't join the call so we go to your items okay it's number five number five nine one one five items okay scrolling down there we are number five all right click on that got it okay now look at the 
look along the bottom. Part oh of the yes, end, yes, I saw this the other day. Yes, uh, but now that's the three G's. Uh, exactly. You see, the, uh, not only is it the goosebump-looking things that are all up the side of that. You see the, the the ruined deck construction type, and then inside all these bumps, there's a certain geometry that goes to that. There, there's two big triangles laying there, and they're all cut up into little small geometric sections that are these little bumps. Yeah. And and behind it is is incredible. The the decking there, the the lighting on this is shining right through the layers. That are behind it, and uh, yeah, to me, that's just amazing. And how can these the folks? Images. How can these folks not know what they've gone to? So if they if they know, and it's this awesome, incredible legacy, how can they dissemble to the world and not jump up and down and say, "For God's sake, look at what we have found"? They're standing behind that clear door that says "Access Forbidden." Yeah. That's why. Yep. So anybody... as I'm looking at their Twitter feeds, yes. as I look at the Twitter, it, I'm looking at the trends. Not even trending. It's uh, breakfast celebrities are trending, and more. It's it's almost like people just care about celebrities and Rogue Fridays and be nice. The nothing. Uh, no, none of the trends are actually for the space stuff. That's rather sad to me that not mm-hmm. more people are interested. Well, it's because we they don't be- know why they should be interested. Who's interested in a dirty, cold piece of rock which basically smells like a cesspool? Exactly. Which, which is how Absolutely. ESSA has sold this object for the last year. The most curious thing about the outgassings of this is oxygen. Of course. You can't have free oxygen. No. Where did it come from? It's coming from a damn tank. <laughs> of course. Free oxygen after several billion years on a piece of uh, a speck of dust. No way, with no with no energy. Anyway, if you want to join the conversation, we have a few minutes left to the end of the hour. Come on, a nice pithy question. Five zero five seven nine six eight eight zero two. Enterprise mission or the other side of midnight. Anyway, is there anything cri- anything crisp? Any of your pictures you want to go over? I don't think we. Uh... Yeah, let me let me now that now that we've got the website back, let me go back to my pictures. Let me go up to uh, Richard's images. Scroll up. I believe it's number nine in my images, which thank goodness are at the top. I have to scroll down past Keith. He's got a library there. Okay, (laughs) number nine, number nine, number nine. Okay, this is what I think this thing is. Now, if in the bottom left hand corner I've done an inset, look at that. Does that look like a rock, or does that look like a pod, a spacecraft, with windows and, you know, surface hatches? And it also looks, if you look really close, it looks beaten up. Now, what does that tell us? That's I was thinking the same from thing. Uh, Keith uh, Stairwell. Yeah, this is the one he, we showed earlier. It was sitting on top of the... Mm-hmm. On the ridge there, and it has like these three holes right in the middle of it, right in the front of it, rather, facing to the left. Yeah. It looks I mean, like, they're like perfect holes. It looks like it's all symmetrical. It looks like a pod. It's got geometry. It's got straight edges. It's got legs. You see the shadow on the back, the kind of edge, that sharp edge coming up at an angle? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The whole damn thing looks like a spade. Now, there's something lying in front of it, like two diameters away, which also is symmetrical. You see, it's got two fins on each side sticking out, and it looks kind of square, mm-hmm. like blocky. It's got it's got right angles. So, in other words, is this another place where there's something sacred, a library, an entrance, an archive, and they've got a map? And if you go and land there, and that's a manned spacecraft, by the way, that's not a probe. You then get out in your spacesuit and you enter and you find, as the movie says, the archive. Yep. Well, I can tell you right now, I mean, just from a lot of these pitches and a lot of these uh, guys will agree, is that I don't believe we're the first one to get on this comment, this no. so-called comment. Um, I was just, we were just commenting about uh, Keith's photo. I think it was, what was it, three or four, Keith, um, at the very base, and it looked like a small cylindrical, white cylindrical object laying there. It looked like some kind of small craft. And if you look around many of these photos, just look at it carefully, and you're going to see these things. They're clearly not natural. No. Nope. Well, for one thing, they're much too bright. Remember, the exactly. average background reflectivity of this thing is like maybe is maybe what five percent. 
These things are like 20, 30, 40 percent, which means they have darkened over time. Yeah. I think anybody who's a skeptic or just doesn't believe in this type of thing, I, I suggest that what they do is, and I do this in a lot of my videos, um, I tell them to just click on a photo, get out a magnifying glass and look these things over. You're going to find some incredible things laying on this rock, this or this two-piece lobe rock, as they call it, which I find amusing <laughs> that they say this slowly came together and collided and, oh, um, uh, what do they say, it fused itself together. One of my images um, <clears throat> is focusing on the specular highlights. Oh, number two, for different yes, reasons. I, I noticed. Okay, define specular for so folks that have forgotten what specular means. Well, like a glare when you're looking and glass is glaring and it's reflecting mm -hmm. the sunlight. It's brighter than the natural rock around it would yep. do, and it's like some of them are coming out of dark places. Like, well, how could it be? It's right next to the shadow. It just right. doesn't. Oh, look it, at it that. It doesn't make sense, the edges of it. I mean, they're, they're just um, baffling. <laughs> There's no way a rock is going to do those that. So when you say specular reflection, it means like a mirror. Like a mirror, yeah. that's right. Like light okay. bouncing off glass. For some reason, everyone trying to call tonight, I cannot connect any group calls. Skype is being very obstreperous. We all updated, and maybe that did something, so... We'll try again. I'm sorry. Um, 425, I can't connect you because if I do, I lose everybody else. So I, I can't do that. Not a good idea. And we can't use the KCA line because it's not connected to Skype, so no one will be able to hear it. So we can't do that either. That will be fixed by next week. Okay. Richard? Yes. Mr. The Curry. Ball. Ah, the tiny balls in the shaft. I've been dying to know what you think. Oh, that okay. Is. Okay. Okay, everybody want to take a guess at what the multiple geometrically arrayed objects, so they're not all spheres, there's some more complex geometry there. It's going to be mind-blowing on these images if they are going to show us, but anybody want to take a crack at what all these nice rhythmic, almost geometric arrangement of stuff in the inside walls of these vertical tunnels might be? What, what picture number are we looking at? Sorry. Well, let's look at number 10. My number 10, up under Richard's items. Okay. This is the close-up now of this, of this uh, tunnel they're landing next to, which has this very interesting uh, Egyptian derivation meaning, Keith. Excuse me, mute button again. Mm -hmm. Was it again? It's more like keepers of secret knowledge. Yeah, right. Something like that. Or yes. the, the, yeah, yeah. Of the, the true knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Now, someone just sent me an image, an image, a message in Skype. Let me see if I can see who it was. It is M. <clears throat> oh my God! She's going to get the gold star. She says it's the ship's arteries, and she's absolutely right. I think, think of the amount of air that you need to circulate and clean and process for however many people can live inside a spacecraft, which is two and a half miles in, in diameter. Think of the volume. We're talking cubic miles, right? How do you clean and purify and recycle the air and all the other fluids so people stay alive? You need a big set of lungs. You need an arterial system to pump fluids and gases, and you need a way to recycle and clean them, I think those little spheres are recycling like vesicles in your lungs that was basically to recycle the air. And that raises the extraordinary question, are we looking at a partly organic spacecraft, a living creature in symbiosis with its occupants, like a couple of TV shows of 20 years ago? Oh, wow, Richard. So you're saying like bronchial. You really yes. just blew everything out the water. <laughs> it's all right in front of us. There's too much organic looking stuff about this. Is that a possible craft sitting there in the hole there on, on the upper bridge of it? Mm -hmm. See it cylindrical? Is that mm -hmm. a possible craft sitting there? Possibly. That made it into the hole? <laughs> and it made it into the hole? Yeah. I was... I was thinking it was like um, like um, 
uh, you know, balconies, not balconies, but, you know, like circular where you have, you could look out, it would, the light would come in, but you'd be there and you, you could look out like there's. No, terror. because there's there's more than one of these, and you've got they're they're they're, they're, they're the local vertical, and they're massive, mm-hmm. which means they're they're meant to distribute something. When you see a tunnel, and you see now there's all these gases jetting out of it, it's broken plumbing. The oxygen, Ooh. the free oxygen, is coming out. I think this was a system as part of as M said brilliantly, an arterial system to keep the ship and the people in it. Alive. Indeed, yes. And the question is, Kudos. do they know what they're falling down on right now as we speak a half a billion miles away in the outer solar system? Of course they do. Oh, so well planned. <laughs> you know. Absolutely. So well planned. Okay. You know they did. So then the question is, when are they going to tell us? When are they going to have the big reveal? When are they going to, or are they waiting for us to create a viral situation where people say, holy blankety blank, look what they haven't told us about? Well, or maybe the last pictures are going to make it so obvious that, you know, everybody will say, oh, my gosh, you know. Maybe they're hoping that those uh, maybe, final shots that they're going to get. Old... May... See, the problem I found over doing this for like 30 years, and everybody's going to agree with me, I find very, very little new stuff that looks like stuff people can recognize. Some of the new spacecraft, like like my favorite spacecraft there tonight, I think that an average person would go and say, yeah, that might be what you think it is. But for most people, looking at this stuff and trying to figure out what they're seeing is like trying to teach them Greek in their sleep. It ain't going to work. They have no background uh-huh. reference. Then they see little push-ins and so forth down there. Yeah. And again, it's back to what do you recognize? And again, I'm going out on a limb here, but I think we're looking at some kind of arterial system. I think M really, really hit it right on the head. God, maybe she is psychic. <laughs> you doubt it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, we're coming up. We've got two minutes left. Any any pithy final thoughts? Because we're going to do this all again next Saturday. John Brandenburg, the guy who thinks there may have been a nuclear war on Mars and has isotopic data to support it, we're going to bring him on, and he's going to do the first hour and lay out his model. Then we're going to bring you guys back, and we're going to show him stuff on Mars that's not made by us, that was made by somebody there, and we're going to see what John can recognize. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, 30 seconds left. Anybody? Finish up the show. Goodbye, Rosetta. Goodbye, Rosetta. Thank you for now. Yeah, thanks. (laughs) Maybe we see something new later. Actually, in about 120 tetrahedral minutes, it will gently land and become an icon in human history. And there's our music. Well, everyone, my guests this morning, and there are too many to name, so go to the website and take a look, because they will be back. And every one of you all around the world listening and following this interesting drama, stay tuned to what happens in the next several days. Watch the images. Go to our website, go to the ESSA website, and pay attention. This is only the beginning. The best is yet to come.